Hey legends, welcome back to the Mason Cox Show. Plenty happening in this episode of the Sports Recap. Anzac Week, we cover Anzac Day, Anzac Eve, all the games over the weekend. Clanger of the Week, also an injury update from myself. Plenty, plenty to cover here. And if you haven't heard the Dustin Fletcher paw that came out before Anzac Day, you have to check that out. Absolute legend of the game. Some great stories from off-season travels. A few parties here and there. But if you haven't heard it, check it out wherever you get your podcast from. And without further ado, let's get into this podcast. All right, let's kick this off. Welcome, Braden. You did it to him again. Poor, Poor Essendon. Thought they had it. <laughs> it was in their grasp, and you just snatched Ripped it. Ripped it away from them. That's so harsh. Um, I would say, like, sorry to the Essendon fans out there, but don't really give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious you're a Collingwood fan. Uh, well, we'll get straight into it. Clanger of the Week. Now, this one, wild. Wild scenes from a Collingwood fan, was it? Yeah, it was a Collingwood fan. And yeah, this one I put up on my Twitter because if you see something, say something, Mace. So if you see <laughs> bad behavior, call it out. Yeah. So obviously this Collingwood fan gets the ball, it gets kicked into the crowd, and he uh, calls over an Essendon player, uh, Kyle Langford, mm. to get the ball. He's like, here you go, mate, got the ball for you. Kyle walks over full well knowing what this idiot's going to do. <laughs> he had the look too. He had the look. A hundred percent. He's about to do something shitty here. <laughs> and he calls him over, and just as he gets there, he throws the ball away and gives him the, like, up yours. Yeah. The hand gesture, like right to his face. And like we're just looking at him like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I put it up there saying, don't be this flog, which yeah, is just, agreed. you know, some pretty basic stuff. You wouldn't do it anywhere else. Anyway, yeah. all the mouth breathers came out of the woodworks on my Twitter and started going, oh, mate, the world's gone bloody soft, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know what's soft? And I'll put this out there. You know what's soft is that bloke would not have done that. If it was in the real world. Oh, no. Because <laughs> because Langford would just slap him in the face. Yep. So he's only doing it because he's he knows that he's protected because the eyes of Australia are on him. There's 100,000 people in the stadium as witnesses and there's broadcast cameras like catching their every move. So that's weak as piss. <laughs> so everyone coming at me and saying, oh, the world's gone bloody soft. That guy's as soft as bloody tissue paper. The second thing that, crack. the second thing that's bloody soft is the bloody avatars in my replies having a crack that a 30-year-old <laughs> mouth breathers sitting in their mother's basement giving me shit in my replies. Have a cry. Jog on, you losers. Well, my favorite part about that is Langford, <laughs> Langford actually kicks the goal and points to the dude who was like, take that. Take that, you bloody Collingwood fan. Exactly. And if he was having a joke and he's this lighthearted mm. larrikin that we all love, he would have had a laugh and gone, good on you, mate. Nice one. You kicked the goal. But no, he sat down like a little bitch <laughs> and just sat there with his like fucking flat face. Just couldn't cop it at all. I've if you're gonna if you're gonna play around, have fun, at least have a laugh when the blo bloke gives it back to you. Oh, 100 percent It's it's funny. People have just said that personifies a Collingwood fan to a T. So the way it. that guy acted, everyone's like, that's a Collingwood fan 101. That's it. And I'm trying to distance myself from that. See something. Say something, call it out, bullshit behavior, and that is the clangor of the week. I'm I, pulling it back to idiot of the week. I, <laughs> He's the idiot of the week. It reminds me of just, I love any time the audience gets uh, interaction with the players because it's always great material. And that's what, I'm not against those interactions. I think this bloke just went over the top. I'm not against the, oh, where's the ball? Where, oh, it must be under my seat. Give me a second while I go down and get it. That's not giving the dude up yours and throwing the ball away like some kind of like year 12 bully at school or something. Like there's time, place, there's vibe, and I just don't think that this guy was getting it. But well, I must say this actually, and I'll, I'll call myself out for this because whenever I first learned what AFL was, I had no idea you had to hand the ball back after a free kick, right? So at one point in my career down in Frankston, the bongo drums were going off up on the hill. The people were going nuts. We were up by about 50 on Frankston. They had no chance of winning before the game even started. Started and I'd given a free kick away and the umpire goes, yep, free kick against you know, Mason Cox ball. Well, it goes Frankston way. And I look at him and I had the ball in my hand. I was like, that's a bullshit free kick. Threw it on the ground. I was like, get fucked. I'm going back to defense. <laughs> Safe to say that led to a 50 meter penalty and a shot on goal for that fella. <laughs> and uh, I've never been more embarrassed in my life. That's There was ones like, without getting too old timey, because they never used to have the like out on the full. 
or yeah. whatever back in the day. So you could just launch the ball into the crowd. <laughs> yeah, miles away and just say, all right, go get it. But oh. yeah, times have changed times for have the changed. better. Times have changed for the better. Well, we'll get into the game of the games of the week. We've got Frio versus the Bulldogs. Bit of spice in this one. There was which a is lot good. of spice. Yeah. So off the top, obviously, Rory Lobb went from GWS to Frio, then across to now playing at the Bulldogs. Mm. Frequent flyers must be through <laughs> the bloody roof. But um, Fre- Fremantle fans didn't forget. And uh, Fremantle players didn't forget because they went straight to him mm. at the top, off the bounce, and they started jumper punching him and ripping him. And Love that. Yeah. It was, you know, it was all... He was a target from from day dot. But it was pretty obvious tongue-in-cheek. You can't go do the whole bravado thing, but you're all smiling and laughing as you're, like, punching each other in the head. It's a bit weird, but I don't know. It didn't last very long because that that bravado didn't carry over into the actual game, and um, Western Bulldogs kind of had their way with it. Lobb played a decent game, but he Mm. kicked, I think, one three. If he had to kick four straight or something, he really had the last laugh. But Bontem Pally. Unreal. uh, insane one of the best very uh, like he's very highly touted don't get me wrong but I still think he's quite underrated his what he does for that team how important he is and like the leadership he shows and then also being able to back that up it is phenomenal what that man is doing on a weekly basis he's just so silky yeah 31 touches two goals and yeah I didn't look at his goal assists but Mm -hmm. I'm sure they were through the roof too also this though about Lob I did respect the way you know they had the can the beer can the lobster tears and the whole like media thing around that you know of him leaving and you know his nickname and all that kind of jazz I I give credit to him because at the end of the game he held up one of the cans he kind of played into the whole thing had a bit of a laugh and like that's what we like we like characters in the game we always say it so credit to him for just owning up to it having a bit of a laugh drinking a little sip of beer after the game from the lobster tears and uh, they would got plenty of marketing that beer company. And then that's <laughs> what I think. I think it all gets muddy when people are like, you know, the guy throwing the ball away is characters and fun and all that stuff. And then like what Lob did is characters and fun and all stuff. Mm. There's nuance to all this stuff. There's like, there's, you know, context to things that exist in the world. And it's, I think, you know, one's happy go lucky fun and then the other's just an idiot. So, but there's a there's a line that needs to be walked and I like characters in the game. Half the stuff that you do, do <laughs> brings like character to the game and makes yeah. the game better. And it's always funner when, you know, the players are the one driving it. So, yeah. We got Alex Pierce. We want to I want to mention this because I know he's um, captain. He's first cap, first year captain, captain C for the Frio Dockers, and he's having a bit of a rough go at the moment. And um, it kind of reminds me of Cogs from GWS, and you know they had the big Amazon series and covered him and his struggles through through captaincy in his first year. It's a very interesting situation with him at the moment. Like and I really, he's actually a legend, Alex. He's like the nicest person you'll ever meet, and. Um, he was, he was one of the first people to get into lob before that game. And it's like, you know, you follow the captain, everyone else joins him and all that. It's, um, it's a bit of a, a change, obviously, with five changing uh, roles and not becoming uh, not being captain anymore and, and him taking the reins. It's, it's a tough thing. It's tough to see someone like somewhat struggle in that role. It is a, yeah, it's a weird one for him because, well, yeah, he had a shocker on the weekend. It was a real stinker. And, you know, it's, it's not too often that, your captain's probably not your best player on the team. Like, mm. it's pretty easy to pick the best guy that's probably never going to see another game of reserves football ever again. Yeah. But, yeah, it's always awkward when it gets to this position where it's like, well, if he was any other player, would he just be dropped for his poor performance? Um, yeah, it is It is a weird one for him and something that they're going to have to work through. But Cogs worked through it, and now he's playing awesome footy. He had a yeah. massive game on the weekend. So, you know, it can happen. It's but- a wait and see. Bit of wait and see. Well, he's all. only 27. It's not yeah. like he's, no, he's over the hill. He's just got to get his head wrapped around all the, all the leadership stuff that comes with it, I think. Now, the next game, Port versus West Coast Eagles. Now, down here, it says Will Schofield. Now, I don't know that if if you know, but he retired. He actually. did retire, but he is playing in the twos for the Eagles. The man's wanting to return. and There is a possibility he might get the midseason draft. So, is that what this means? Come back, play in the reserves. Like, we all know as, uh, West Coast have... No players yeah. left. Yeah. <laughs> it's they're, a rough try for them at the moment. They're running on empty. So it's so you think that's that's the plan here? Come back through I, the twos and get picked up in the mid season draft. I would love to see it. 
I would love to say he looks about 40, but <laughs> I, think I don't think it matters. <laughs> nah, Hearn's still playing. That man hasn't had, had hair for, for 20 years. He's looked 40 since he was 20. Oh, oh Hearn's like, oh man. Oh, he's got the hell of a kick though. But yeah, I'd love to see Will be one of those players that kind of like retire. He's doing the podcast and a few of the media things. And he's like, you know what? I think I've still got it. I've got a medal. I've got a 2018 premiership medal. I can come back and play. And it would be great to see somewhat of a person who's thought they've retired, moved on, come back and just really show what's left in the tank. And if someone said, here, come back, we'll give you a hundred grand for half a year's footy. Everyone's saying yes. <laughs> Everyone's saying yes. Um, now, the other thing I want to I mention, this is a bit of a, a heavier topic. Now, Jeremy Finlayson, uh, what he's doing right now is phenomenal. And his his wife, prayers up to her, she's, um, she's going through a really tough time. And um, I just want to shout him out, man. Like it's, I can't help to try to put myself in his position and I couldn't put it on, you know, like a, a, you wouldn't put it on your worst enemy kind of stuff, you know, and the way he's being able to handle it, the way I think both of them have been so open about the whole journey and, and what's happening is, is such a credit to him. It can be such a tough time to have to go through that. And it's, it's absolutely just amazing to see the way they're handling it and the way he's playing given all the circumstances that's going on. So I want to give a shout out to him because he's what, what he's performing, what he's doing, what he's going through and, and what the family's having to deal with. It's, um, it's, a, it's a credit to him. I, I seriously could not speak highly of him or highly more highly about him and what he's having to go through and how he's handling it. So to shout out to, to Jeremy Finlayson, the whole family. And I um, just want to wish you all the best in the, the fight ahead. And he's actually like, not that it matters in the slightest in, like what's going on, but he's playing amazing yeah. footy. Like on top of all of that, like strong character to come out and kind of still compete and do what he's doing with so much that would be weighing on his mind. Um, yeah. So shouts out to Jeremy and, and the family. We'll, we'll move on next. GWS versus Brisbane. Country road, take me home to a place. Holland, West Virginia. God. Charlie Cameron kicks another bag. Kicks oh another God. bag. I wish that he didn't now. Um, <laughs> Charlie Cameron kicks seven. Um, wasn't even at home, so the music <laughs> didn't play, which is great. Um, can you uh, tell me where West Virginia is? I oh, it's I the, assume <laughs> it's west of Virginia. It's like where all the Bogans of America live. And Nolan, my brother, just says all the time, he says, there's nothing more fitting than a whole bunch of Queensland Bogans talking about <laughs> a place in America where all the Bogans live. So did you say West uh, uh, Brisbane game? Brisbane, Queensland is the West Virginia of it's, Australia? Yes, very much so. <laughs> I love Queensland, don't get me wrong. But if you were to say where most Bogans live, I think every Australian would say Queensland's probably number one on their list. Which is, yeah. Well, I feel like, what about this? I heard this the other day. When someone Someone's like, oh, what type of music do you listen to? And it's like, oh, I listen to all music. Mm. Country music is still excluded from that, like yeah. all music. It's, it's, Except for in Queensland. It sits outside of all genres. But uh, Charlie Cameron also, one of his seven was an amazing goal. Now, I don't yeah. know if you've seen this, but it was it was a soccer goal, but not a traditional, you know, kick it and it comes forward off the boot and goes through the goals. Yeah, It was like a cross in from the corner and he like – flattened out his boot and glanced it through the goals. Um, it's a freak. Yeah. And I do another podcast with uh, Adam Trelaw and Josh Dunkley. Mm. And Dunk said that uh, Charlie was showing everyone the replay on his, <laughs> on his phone. <laughs> I love that. And he was claiming that, you know, he did it on purpose, which makes sense. He was also claiming that he got a hand to it and guided it down to the boot, which uh. on the replay, the ball's like two meters away from his hand. So I don't know <laughs> if it's like delusion, but yeah, it was like a really soccer-esque kind of just helping it on its way to the back corner type goal. But yeah, I don't know how he does half the stuff that he does, but uh, let's move ahead and go straight into the grand final rematch yes. that was built up the all hype. week. And it was exactly that. I I checked my uh, Foxtel box to make sure that I wasn't playing a replay of oh. the grand final because <laughs> Geelong went out there and just smashed Sydney from, you know, go to woe. It was, it was basically an identical game. It was rough. I thought, like... I think Sydney's a great team and they, I mean, they've beaten Richmond and stuff this year. They've played in some, some good games and yeah, I was the same. Whenever I saw the score, I was like, is this like, is there something wrong with what's going on? Like I was so confused by it and you just kind of thought that, you know, with what happened last year and everything else, they'd have that motivation to come out and just try to spank you along, you know, like anytime someone beats you in the grand final, like having experienced that also, it's like you have a point to prove. 
And um, whenever I sat there and looked at the score, I was just, I was baffled. I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. And it does speak to Geelong's ability to play at home at GMHBA. They're a very, very good home team. I think that was the interesting thing though, because I think the stat going into it was like Sydney had beaten Geelong at their home, mm. like two of the last three times. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, so you start to get this, okay. And they're going to come out and it said that they were going to use the, you know, grand final pain to like spur them on to try harder and stuff. So coming out fully G'd up and ready to take them on full of confidence and then just get wiped off the park. That's got to do some like mental scarring mm. type damage to like Sydney, but like they're definitely going to be better. They'll get the McCartans back. They'll get Rampy back. I think they'll get Hickey back. Like losing, they lost a lot of personnel and it doesn't help having zero defenders when you're coming up against Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins. Cause <laughs> Kicking a bag. Oh, Both of them. Kicked 5 oh, that's straight a, shots. Did not to hit a slaughter. point. Oh my God. Brutal. Oh. Jeremy Cameron on target to kick 100 for the season right. still. And Insane. It's, we're heading into round seven. I gotta have a noise for every single time Jeremy Cameron kicks a bag because it'll be like country road. Take me out. Maybe like a little moo. That's what I'm yeah. thinking. Jeremy Cameron, give him the moo every time he kicks a bag, which is every freaking week. <laughs> Doesn't mind it. And another story from their forward line, Sam Simpson got really horrifically concussed yeah. in the 2020 grand final early on and kind of hasn't really seen footy since then. Mm. Super popular within the club, came out, kicked the first goal of the game. Talk about feel good moments. Yeah. All the boys got around him, had another couple for the game. Um, it was great to see him back and just a real, you know, feel good story. Yeah, it was, um, it was awesome to see him back out there. Like you, you always talk about like the Alex Johnsons of the world, you know, that had his ACLs done so many times and whenever they come back out and are able to perform at the highest level, it's awesome. Um, so cool. And shout out to Alex Johnson because whenever he came back, he played on me and shut my ass down. So really? Was, yeah. He's like a foot yep. shorter than Yeah, him. I know. He's pretty, he was a pretty good player if he had decent knees. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's awesome to see these players who have gone through the ringer with injury because it's such a hard thing with rehab and being on your own at times and not being, feel like you're part of the club whenever everyone else is playing. And, um, shout out to, to Sam. It's it's pretty pretty cool to see someone who's been through the ringer be able to come out and uh, kick the first goal too and see the players get around him. is such a special moment he'll never forget. Now talk about special moments. Hawthorne v. Crows. Ooh. What a game. People were lining up around the block to go to this one. Uh, I think it was in Tassie and I think about 12 people rocked up. <laughs> but those 12 people were in for a game. Can't it wait was, till they get the Tassie team. It's going to be great. It was a nail biter. The we whole don't have time. money, AFL. We got enough to spend on the Tassie oh, it's team. It's a harsh one because people are saying mm. stuff like that. But it's like Tassie, you government couldn't pay money. me to go to a Hawthorne v. Crows game. You sure, couldn't yeah. give me enough money. But... <laughs> <laughs> it was um, Darcy Fogarty kicked the what you'd call the match winner. Had yep. a minute to go mm. on the you know on the on fence. An angle. He yeah. was he was sitting on the fence, and um, everyone would have gone the snap or the banana or kicked it across the body. He went dead straight, drop punt, split the sticks. It was a great goal. They uh, Adelaide held on to win by you know a, a, a couple of points, but. You know, Collingwood coming up against them next week. They Whoa. are in form. They That's are it. surprise packet of the season. So I far. think they go under like under the uh, under the radar a bit just because they're from Adelaide. Like they're not the Melbourne team. We don't see as much news around them. Everything else. Like I think they are playing really good football at the moment, and it's going to be a great showdown at their home ground. Yeah. Well, luckily, we've got a little bit of experience thanks to the gather round of uh, <laughs> a little bit of playing at Adelaide over. Home. With, yeah, essentially a game before this, our second home at the moment. We've played more, we've played just as many games there, I feel like, as the MCG after this game. So, uh, yeah, it'd be a great game. Like the Crows are, are on a bit of a roll and the Hawks are struggling a bit. You know, they're um, they're in the race for the wooden spoon and they're uh, they're leading, the, I think they're leading the charge at the moment. Yeah, it's not, there's not too many in that race. Like normally we'd just assume North is down there going, <laughs> going for it hard, but. Hawks would give, give them a real challenge, uh, run for their money. It's going to be interesting. Hawthorne, we all always knew they were going to suck. They're like, rebuilding. Like, it's part of the experience. It's yeah, part of, they, you know, like they're they had rebuilding their, from nothing. They had their premiership years, and that's how it always goes. It's a cyclical kind of thing, you know. Now you bring these new young kids in, you have to get some games into them. And now they have experience at a younger age with these games in from uh, from this year and the years before. So it's, it's part of the rebuilding process. And that's, yeah, I guess the way up between Hawthorne and North is like, you probably, if you're a Hawthorne fan sitting there with like three flags back to back to back, you're probably pretty happy. Yeah. <laughs> North yeah. haven't done much since, you know, the 2000s kicked off and we're 23 years in. 
Uh, North is like, North is always, like, they almost beat us last year. So, like, they have potential. Yeah. They do have potential. How good are almost wins? They're the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> heading into the Carlton St. Kilda game, this was a good one. Because I was pumped for this because yeah. it, it was one of those, every now and then you come across a game that's mm. like, okay, let's test out these teams. You test don't know where St. Kilda's really sitting. You don't know where Carlton's really sitting. Well, St. Kilda's still firmly sitting on top of the ladder. Yeah, right? number one. Carlton's. You know, down there punching away. Mm. Um, it was a really exciting game, probably up until midway point of the third quarter where St. Kilda really just ran away with it. Yeah. Which is, yeah, you know, it's surprising. Carlton have the last two Coleman medalists and they just really struggle to kick a goal. So mm. you assume it's a bit more up the field that must be the issue to be getting the ball in there quicker because, you know, if you were a midfielder and you're looking down at, Harry and Charlie, you'd just, be, get it in. just get it in yeah. there, wouldn't you? But we'll sort the rest. Yeah, at the moment, that even the forward line, they're trying to separate those two because they can. You're almost spoilt for choice. You yeah. got you got too many good forwards up there. Um, yeah, how did you see this one? It was an interesting match because Carlton had a lot of touches. They mm. had the top six disposal getters. Four of those had mid to high thirties. And it didn't seem to help him at all. I've said this multiple times. Stats, midfielders, win Brownlows. Does this mean that Brownlows are not important? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> Maybe give one to like a forward or a defender at some point. I mean, like when was the last time a Brownlow medal winner was a defender? Jeez, you just know as a defender, you got no chance of winning that thing. No. But it was it was interesting because they did dominate in the middle with the you know touches and everything else, but they just couldn't convert them into goals. And... It's uh, they're very kind of contest team. So they kick down line, Carlton. They want the contest, and then they kind of you know spread from there. And if that doesn't work, it's like you know what's what's Plan B? Like they the St Kilda team, they they put that pressure on. If they can bring it to ground, they're really good at bouncing, really good at bouncing back and uh, kicking goals. So yeah, it was um, it was interesting. Harry had a bit of struggle in front of goals, um, and it's yeah, it's it's a you know every every player goes through these little you know confidence. Lols, I guess, whenever it comes to goal kicking. And I think you mentioned it before the pod about him kicking like six different types of kicks yeah. for goal. Yeah. So they showed it on the couch. He had no consistency, no routine. Mm. He would, you know, play on from one, kick a snap, kick a banana, you know, the drop punt. Like he did everything under the sun, but probably just needs more consistency by the looks of it, you know, yeah. try a drop punt. Oh, it fades right. Okay. Adjust that and go from there. But you know, it's got to be something like if you're going to go the snap, just go all snaps. Like, yeah, like, so, like Rewalt did that for a year or two. He's yeah. just like snapping from literally dead in front. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting one for me because he, he looks like he kicks like a really good snap and yeah. he can kick distance. Like most guys, they do it within 30. Yep. But he can comfortably kick it, you know, 40, 45, close to 50 meters on the snap. Um, so, yeah, I, it would be good to see him pick something, pick one of them. And just, yeah, it's like do something, do one really well and just commit to that and training that throughout the week. Look, once I retire and stuff, Harry, if you want some help, happy to help you out and get that thing sorted. That is, you said everyone goes through these down patches. Have you ever had a down patch goal kicking? Because oh. everyone kind of pr pumps you up for your goal kicking accuracy. <laughs> Knock on wood! Knock on wood! Um, Don't worry, I'll knock you down. No, I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, I've, I've had little like yips in my, like, I think a lot of it was whenever I had my eye issue and like that changed my depth perception There's of actually like sticks. dropping it. Yeah, I was like, uh, where's the ball? Just swing at something. Um, we've kind of fixed it now, but yeah, it was it was something I think everyone goes through a certain like confidence lull. And, you know, you might miss two or three or four from a certain angle. And, like, I have my, like, Bermuda Triangle that, like, I know I'm not as good kicking from. I'm not going to tell you where <laughs> that is, shit. Braden. But, like, I have a little area that I know I'm probably not as confident from because I tend to somehow, for some reason, like, not make as many percentage shots as that from that angle. So, everyone has their yips. Like, and, you know, I think the biggest thing is probably just getting back to basics, kicking goals from as close to the goals as possible to give you a higher percentage. And even in training is like, do that, get really good at that, kick like five in a row, make it feel better, then kick, you know, 10 meters back and then 10 meters back and then, 10, and then you go on the angles and then you kick those. So like you start getting your confidence up knowing that like, if I can kick one in front, yes, tick. Like 
I'm not worried about, you know, missing a shot. Like the chances of missing a shot from there is like zero. So then you kind of work back your confidence from there to get better at it. So yeah, there's, um, yeah, I hope Harry starts getting his stuff sorted because uh, he's he's a freak. He's a really good player. Great hands on the man. Um, great hands and be able to take a contested mark. And if he can kick goals for that team, that team can, uh, there's no, no, no limit to what they can do. One thing that shits me up the wall, and I like, I don't want to get into, you know, old man at the pub territory, but yeah. why do people do long run ups, set shots at goal? Like if, if you were taking a field kick yep. and you had to hit someone across the field at 30, 40 meters away, you could take two steps and hit them, you know, nine out of 10 times. Maybe yep. not you, maybe someone good. <laughs> <laughs> but like, why, why don't players just go take the mark, two, three steps back? Kick it through the sticks. Why do you have to do something so unnatural? You don't go back 30, 40 meters off the mark and like do a massive plot in feel run. Like you're really picking out one player in your head. Not just all of them. Like, like what player, when like Pendles doesn't mark the ball like in the midfield and then go back 30, 40 meters to try and make a field kick? Yeah. It's something that seems so unnatural. Yep. But like all these forwards are really good field kicks. Mm. So why don't they just go back? five meters and kick it off a step or two. Brayden, I'd love to be able to give you that answer, but it's because people tell I, you what you have to do. Oh, this I is have, what we've done forever. If I'm 10 meters out, if I'm two meters out, if I'm 50 meters out, if I'm 40 or 30, I have the exact same routine and the exact same amount of steps and this exact same amount of flips of the ball before I kick it. I think it's dumb as shit. I have a crack. AFL players suck at kicking it through the sticks. There's you got a nine meter gap across that you just got to put this tiny little ball through. You know what? Maybe we should actually put you in front of goals at different angles and let's see what your percentage set shot would be. Yeah, but and I I'll suck. just go get a crowd of like twenty or thirty people just to give you shit from the sidelines and see how you go. But I suck. So it's like if, if, if you if you every You've been playing footy probably longer than I have. Every player could hit a, a, another person standing thirty meters over there. Yeah, ten out of ten times. But then you put this massive nine meter it's like a, gap in front of them. It's a head game. Mentally weak people play football. It must be the, the I agree with complaining you. about people in his DMs about oh you're too soft. You don't know what it's like to you don't know what it's like to cop hate online, mate. <laughs> yeah, of course not. <laughs> All right, we'll move into the next one. We're Gold Coast, North Melbourne. We've got the Anzac Day. There's a big ending to this. We've got to get through it. Oh, I'm glad we've, we've moved built, on to Gold Coast and North Melbourne. I know you're real excited about this one. Built Brady. up to this one. Let's just skim it. Uh, <laughs> prayers up. We've got a prayers up. Yep, prayers up. Took Miller. Probably one of my favorites going around. Greatest athlete in the NFL. Dude just easily. runs. I reckon he's Unreal. he's got an an actual engine inside his body. Yep. They're, they've done doesn't some, run out of petrol. He doesn't. He just keeps going. I reckon that's, yeah, he, he must just stop by the bench. They fill him up with diesel and off he goes. Mm. But yeah, unfortunately, he's got a bit of a knee injury, but he escaped an ACL. So there's yeah. some good news there. He'll be out a few weeks and he'll just be running straight back into the team, no doubt. Ben King, another- Kicks a bag. Another good story. Like seeing Ben King out there. First few weeks, he was- Bit fumbly, dropping yeah. kind of everything coming his way. Kicked five on the weekend. It's always good to verse north. Just get you into a bit of form. <laughs> but but um, apparently he's coming to uh, Collingwood next year. So it's good to get him into a bit of form. Slot straight into the side. <laughs> I don't know how he'd handle a, a big forward like that who kicks goals. Like we haven't really had one of those since probably like Trav Cloak. Yeah. There's always been like a very even spread, I feel like, of forwards where it's not just like we have one option to go to or one like preferred option. It's like we have five that are going to hit you up and like try to get the ball and everyone can kick. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, that's beyond me who, who comes to the club, but it'd be so interesting, I guess, for us if we played – a big ticket like Ford who were paying bulk coin to be up there kicking snags. Oh, I don't, I'd love to see him there, but geez, the pressure, don't do it to yourself, son. It's, it's not <laughs> worth it. You got to be able to handle oh. the big lights. See, if he was playing at Collingwood and he had the first few games that he did where he was dropping, you know, marks Oof. and stuff, he would have been crucified for the past month in the media, yep. which wouldn't have made things any better. And we probably wouldn't have seen a five goal game from him because he'd just be shattered, you know, mentally. So, you know. Maybe it's not worth playing for some of the big clubs sometimes. It's beyond my decision, Brayden. But we'll move into the next one, the Anzac Eve match. This, okay, I've got to ask you, what's better, Anzac Eve match or Queen's birthday? King's birthday, sorry. R.I.P. R.I.P. <laughs> Prayers up, up to the OG. up to the OG. Uh, Longest monarch. It is good. I, I don't know. The intro is great. Like mm. the nighttime, 
just the visual of all the like flashlights, you know, and then you got the cauldron. Being, oh, it's so cool. See, they're the moments for the nighttime games. You have yes. some special night times, daytime grand final, nighttime uh, King's birthday Eve. No, what are we? F- <laughs> Anzac Eve. Anzac, Anzac Eve. Anzac Eve, yeah. Um, so they got the horse, they got the torch, they got everyone had their like lights out. It just looks great. It, it's special. It's amazing visual. I think the celebrations across the whole weekend are great where yeah. they did, you know, the last post and stuff before every game. Everyone stands there, yeah. pays their respects, national anthems, the works. It's all great. AFL again, big tick for what they do to celebrate occasions. Uh, but Did you love the AFL? You just support oh, well, the IF. I feel like we're too opposite into the spectrum. I got to throw them a crumb because every time we do a podcast, you're just shitting on them. <laughs> we got, they got, so it's going to keep them in line. So uh, this game, Van Roy and everyone oh, goes, yeah. Roo in the crowd. I don't. Very close to boo. <laughs> very, very close, close to, boo, to boo. And I don't think it's Van Ruin. Um, but <laughs> he was, he was, they said after the game, Goody said after the game, that he was one rotation off oh. getting subbed out of the game. Mm. And they said, oh, we'll take Brody off. He'll have a rest. And then we'll sub Van Royen out of the game. Get him off. He's been junk. Anyway, in that span of that one rotation, he comes out, just starts clunking pack marks and kicking snags. And, you know, he, grew in confidence. He yeah. looked like, you know. He saw the light at the end of the tunnel says, oh, I'm just going to give it all here. I'm going to get subbed off anyway. And what happens? No, we're not subbing you off anymore, mate. You've gone well. We're going to keep you out. Talk about <laughs> sliding doors moments. Like those are things that can like, you know, progress your career, you know, big steps yeah. really quickly. He, yeah, he looks like he's going to be a ripper. Um, and they were speaking to him post game and speaks really well to like, yeah. is just, you know, seems to be enjoying being out there and um, he wasn't, you know, some players come out, Nick Dacos, bit, di, 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 give us a bit. He's a, nah. he's a just, nah, the, he's smarter. He's than that. too professional, Nick Dacos, but we'll <laughs> get 19. to that. What we will say though is what, what I'll say, I'll distance you from this, but Richmond are Ooh. stinking it up. Oh, One God. win, four big L's and a draw. I don't know what's going on there because they got two absolute stars in over the off season, and I don't know if they've been like the answer. It takes a bit for players to you know pick up the game plan and start to gel with other teammates. I don't know if it's that or what. But they've had a, a, a like a pretty solid schedule to start the season. They've lost their ruckman, um, who's one of the captains. I want to say was Nate Curvis, the big Nank. And um, had you know Rewall was injured for a little bit too, and they had the head gash and all that. So there's been a few injuries and stuff that have rolled through that team. And it's kind of interesting though, because a lot of people go, "Oh man, they are like alarm bells." Richmond's one and four, but any team that's going up against Richmond that week, or well, you best believe they they realize Richmond can come out and just spank them. So every team's on edge every time you play that team. There's no whether they're one and they could be one win for the whole season, be in the last game. You're still worried about what they're going to be able to produ- produce. Yeah. And I think that's fair to say about most of the competition. Yeah, it's pretty even. But, and another thing that I would say is just jumping back to St. Kilda. St. Kilda have so many injuries. They're going to get yeah, it's true. half their team back and they're going to be better again. Collingwood, they're going to get half their team back and be better again. And these teams are up the top of the ladder. So I don't see it as an excuse. You can't go, oh yeah, you know, we got a few injuries. We get to be shit. Like, yeah, they're... It's it's a very interesting. There's there's a few teams, and we'll. I think Richmond will have a run. I think we'll win five, six, seven straight, and then this whole thing will just even out, and they'll be like eight and four. It's an interesting one because everyone's just waiting for a run, but it's like, is mm. it the Richmond of old or are they just old? <laughs> you know, time will tell, Braden. Time will tell. Now, I want to get into this because you finally get to feel what it freaking feels like to watch <laughs> Collingwood from the sidelines, and it's torture. I'm sitting there, <laughs> absolute torture. They trick me uh, every time. I'm sitting there going, like, already, you know, got the got the tweet sitting in the drafts, going, oh well, good try. We'll get them next week. Type uh, type shit in my Twitter draft, but god damn, you just come back and. What ha- what the hell happened? Seven goals to nothing in the last quarter. What was that? I don't know. It's not the first time, right? So the fact that you don't expect it, I think you probably have learned your lesson a few times before this, but it was awesome. The day, 95 plus thousand at the G. It was one of the best atmospheres I've ever seen. Like amazing. Obviously the day within itself, super, super memorable for anyone that experiences that. But then to have the crowd, the two teams be up the top of the ladder and the rivalry and everything that goes with it, it was an atmosphere 101, one of the best I've ever experienced. 
let's go back and talk us through the week because it's a big mm. week. Anzac, it's Anzac Day, but it's Anzac Week because so much stuff happens. How did the club kind of celebrate it? It's yeah, it's um, I don't know if it's necessarily probably celebration, but more recognition. Uh, it's always an interesting one of how to describe Anzac Day to people. Um, but during the week, uh, every single year, I feel like we always have a veteran or someone who's served. Um, in the Anzacs or is an Anzac and we went to the shrine as a team uh, we're told some really cool stories about some past players that have played uh, for the club that have gone and fought in the wars and um, it was just a phenomenal kind of humbling experience whenever you kind of have those those people tell those stories and see some of the memorabilia some of the physical stuff that's from uh, from World War One and World War Two. and there was a there was a cigarette holder that we talked about and um, there was a bullet that hit it and saved a person's life and it was in his breast pocket. And it's just like, there's these little stories like that, you know, and it's just like little, you know, little difference between life and death and war and the craziness of how one little thing can change and allow you to essentially make it through such a terrible, like scarring experience. And we go to the eternal flame, have a chat there and stuff as a club. And it was, it was really kind of moving like, and every single time this comes around this, this day, it's, um, it's pretty phenomenal just to how so many people get behind it and pay such respect to it. And everyone here, I feel like has some kind of link or experience through a family member or someone they know with war. Like, and it's so prevalent in Australian history that it's, it's pretty amazing to have a day where we can honor the, the Anzacs and, and play and bring attention to what they've done through football. It's really cool. And shout out to, to Shidi who, you know, has created this whole thing to be able to, to create this experience for everyone and to see how many Anzacs were there on the day and have the cards go around. And it was just awesome. Walk every single year. It's the, you know, it's the one you look at on the calendar. You say, I can't wait to play this game. It would. Yeah. It's cool as a player. It's got to be like one of the biggest draw cards for coming to the club. Coming to the club. Yeah. Like it's a massive day. It's a massive occasion. How did you spend it in the stands? Um, stressing. <laughs> Just stressing so much. I think whenever you're in the stands, you see how, you know how the game is supposed to be played. You know, whenever someone like messes up or someone does something really well and like you're just like constantly like kind of judging the game because you know the background information behind it. It's just like, oh, you just live on the edge. You really live on the edge and you're sitting there. You're like, oh, I'm going down at halftime. I can give you, you know, I can help out Billy Frampton to tell him this or that that's happening in the game or give him a pump up or whatever it is. And you're like, what can I do to help this team kind of win the game? And you do feel kind of helpless in the stands like because you want to be on the ground playing and be able to physically do something that can change the the result of the game. But yeah, it was it was stressful. But like it was so cool to see people and you know, Eston was up by like 20, 30 points and then that first goal and then the second goal and the third, fourth and then it goes seven goals in a quarter and the Collingwood chant and the fans going nuts and giving it to everyone else. And it was just like the atmosphere just like kind of grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then, you know, we, we hit the front and then we kick another one and then another one and Bo finishes off with the, you know, the kick after the siren to make it. And it was just such a cool, cool time to like to be there in an Anzac day that's very different for me. I, I always prefer obviously playing, but it was a really cool experience to be on the other side watching it and having that connection to the players and um I don't know I was just like so proud of him after like and I remember like someone was telling me I was on broadcast and I'm sitting there and I was just like looking at the team I was like you almost get like emotional like it's such a cool experience that everyone has in life that you'll never forget and I remember like talking to Bobby Hill I was like Bobby this will be a game that will live on in your life forever in your head like you'll never forget this well those big games they literally talk about them forever like yeah. in the week leading up it's all, what was your favorite Anzac Day moment? What was your yep. favorite like game moment? You know, Blairy's soccer through, Zaharakis goal, Swanee kicking four. Like mm. there's always moments within a game that are literally talked about forever. So yeah. it is a pretty, you know, big occasion. Were you sitting there at the start of the fourth confident being five goals down that you could get the job done or were you, you get the nerves kick in? Uh, you always got a little bit of nerves because they were up by, I think it was like 20 or something in three quarter time. And I knew we had to, we had to get like the first, we need to get a bit of momentum. We had to get like one, we couldn't let them score like a goal or two goals to start off the like quarter. We had to get the first and gain that momentum and just build from it. And that's what we do. Like we do that really well and we handle the situation and the pressure. I feel like very well as a club. Um, and I think we went into a bit more of an attacking kind of game style, which we 
for some reason, anytime we go into attacking, we're like, just go, just go. We kick goals. Like just, you almost think we should just constantly play in this kind of attacking mode because it just always seems to go really well for us. Um, but yeah, we went into that and just, you know, one after another and, um, you know, we just got that confidence and just kept rolling with it as if, you know, and I, I talked to Nick after the game and he was just like, man, how good is this? And I was like, you just, you feel it. You're like, you know, if it was a one-off, you'd, you'd kind of be like, oh my gosh, but like whenever you get that first goal, he's like, we've been here, we've done this, we're going to do it again. Like today's the day and you just, another goal, another goal. And you just have that belief that you're going to actually win the game, even though you might be down by like 14, 20 points, whatever it is, you've got that momentum, you know, the goals will come in the, the time that you have left. And you speak about needing the first goal. Now, Billy Frampton, oh, massive game, playing in the ruck. God, he, God bless the man. He drip, like drifts down and takes a mark on Sam Draper mm. and goes back and kicks the goal. Now, most teams, if you're down by like four or five goals and you kick a goal, you're probably not really trying to show too much emotion because yep. I don't know if it's just Australia or whatever, but you, you kind of keep a lid on it. Um Everyone, Darcy Moore from like, you know, the back line gets all the way up and gets around Billy Frampton because it's his first goal. The team just seemed, you know, alive in that yeah. moment and full of confidence. And it was like, okay, we're on. It was, it was cool. Like Billy taking that mark on Draper, like he had a big, big role that day. Like he got the two big Phillips and Draper who are going against some two legitimate Ruckman and a guy who's a backman, <laughs> like he like, doesn't play much rock and he's in his first year at the club. Like it's credit to Bill, like amazing what he's doing right now and filling a role that the team needs and he's going really well at it. So yeah, for him, I remember whenever he took that mark, there was, I can't remember what player it was, but there was a player behind him. If you look at the vision, he turns around to the defenders and says, come in. Cause like sometimes you kind of forget it's a first goal of someone's cause you're in mm -hmm. the moment and everything else, right? You're like, oh, we kick this goal. He's lined back up all that. And one of the players had the thought process to turn around and said, no, nah, it's his first goal. Everyone come in. And he pointed to the defenders. And then you see this crowd of just the rest of the players come in and get around him. And um, yeah, to kick your full first goal on Anzac Day, um, especially for someone who's a defender, it doesn't get many opportunities to do it. And he was dead set right in front, kicked it. And I think that, you know, that momentum of just belief and happiness and joy for someone like just bleeds into the next thing, bleeds into the next center bounce, bleeds into the next stoppage, bleeds into the next, you know, inside 50. And that confidence just keeps growing. So yeah, like little moments like that, I think are a lot bigger than people realize. And speaking on, you know, infectious joy uh, in, in little moments, Braden Maynard kicking in from, you know, <laughs> fullback has an absolute stinker, yeah. <laughs> slides off his boot, goes to an opponent who kicks a goal, cuts to him, and he's having a laugh about it. Yeah. His teammates come over, they're having a laugh about it, cuts to the bench and Fly is having a laugh about it, and even one of the assistants is having a laugh about it. So the whole team is having a laugh about this absolute shocking mistake that <laughs> leads to a goal. In a big game. In a massive game, yeah. in, a, in a big moment. And... I don't know, you can probably speak more on it, but it just seemed like, you know, let's not punish these errors. Let's not harp on it. Let's move on to the next contest. There's a little bit of information behind this that people don't know about. Um, before the game, Craig had made a comment around. He said, like, you know, mistakes are going to happen in this game. Like, just move on. Smile about it. Move on. Like, it doesn't mean you're a bad kick. It just means you made one mistake and life is going to go on. We play on. It's all good. So... Whenever I think he sprayed that, it was kind of almost like it was coming to fruition and all of a sudden it happened and everyone just kind of <laughs> laughed because we'd already talked about this going to happen. And then everyone just kind of was like, oh, well, this is, he, he predicted the future. And like, it just kind of moved on. And it's, I think that's one thing our team does really well. It's like, we don't, we don't sit there and, you know, just think about the mistakes we just made for a long time. Like we just say, you know what, that's that moment. We move on to the next one. And it was just, I think the, the, the reason everyone was smiling because of the comments that were made before the game about it and um, yeah, it, it coming to, to, to truth, which was pretty funny with itself. But yeah, we're, we're really good at just being able to um, live in the moment, I think, rather than worry about the moments that had passed. And that's some, one of our strengths as a team. And that leads to, I think, these, these fourth quarter comebacks where we don't stress about thinking, oh, we could have done this, we could have done that. It's like, well, what can we do in the next 20 minutes to win this game? Now, we can't go any further without bringing up the GOAT, the current the goat, GOAT, Scott Pendlebury. Yes, thank you. <laughs> On the wing. I was very good to say something else. I was like, too young. <laughs> too young, Brandon. <laughs> On the wing, goes up and cops a hit in the face yeah. and goes down. And whenever I see Pendles on the ground, I know it's bad because yeah. he doesn't he fake. Whinge. He doesn't yeah. pretend. He doesn't whinge. 
He just goes on like with the business, but he stayed down, cut into him, and he's holding his eye. And yeah, look, yeah. he gets a poke in the eye. Um, another thing, he said he got cracked in the nose, but you know that's why I thought the nose was there to protect his eyes. It's that big. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's gone down with an eye injury, and then just you know flashbacks of mason injury retinas <laughs> all this stuff just started hitting me i'm like oh no, oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's happened again oh. so do you have any word on pendles is he all right oh, i is thought he... he might be joining the goggle gang for a little bit <laughs> i thought gang. that he was gonna join the goggle gang that's um, that's merch we need goggle merch. gang goggle gang um no I, I, I did i did see it happen it was kind of you get punched in the face and because of the eye injury sometimes like you don't really know it happens until um, like later and like he had his eye was like really swollen after the game yeah. but um, I did see him after the game I just kind of told him so if there's anything let me know but um, I asked him I said do you see floaters and one one sign is like if you see a bunch of black dots running around everywhere like in your sight it's not a good sign um, and he said no he didn't see any of that so I kind of was like okay you might might be all right here. Um, Do you get money and- outside the cap for being like an eye specialist for the club? <laughs> I've had that many issues now. I feel like I could diagnose someone just looking at him. Uh, but no, he's he seems to be all right. Um, I'm not really too sure kind of what where I'll land. I, I think it might be um, a few eye drops we'll probably have to take or something like that to make sure it doesn't get infected or anything like that. But we've had a few players like Jack Chris had an eye injury, Brody Grundy had an eye injury in, in training. This is all after I had him. So the guy who's our specialist is very much, he loves Collingwood, Jonathan. And he would be working overtime with our team now. <laughs> like, I feel like that man has got that many a clients come through. Uh, Jonathan Yo, Y-E-O-H. I'm just going to give a shout out to him because he's the reason I'm playing football still. You're the reason he's probably got a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> just floating around. That many are recommendations for the man. Uh, he does a really, really good job. Mad calling a supporter. So um, he'll have a look at him. They'll get a bit of an update, but I think hopefully he should be all right. Now from the current GOAT to, to the future. The future GOAT. We talk about Nick Dacos. Now, okay, let's just touch on it. He had 40 disposals, nine score involvements, two goals when it absolutely mattered. Yes. In the last quarter, basically winning the game. So throughout the week, he copped criticism, unnamed criticism. Everyone kind of oh. just skirted around it going like, oh, I don't know, some people are talking shit. I don't know, not me. I wouldn't talk shit. But maybe if there's yeah. people that, you know, insinuating that he gets most of his kicks off cheap handballs running around the back. I'll say it. No one else is going to mm. say it. But there's a reason to that, surely. There's a reason. Is he one of the best kicks in the game, and does he set up nine goals on Anzac Day with his 40 touches? Yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. I, like, look, I've said this. I've, I've told Nick this. is like the way Australia works and the way the media is, is they're going to build you up, and they're building him up well and truly building him up and they're going to try to tear his ass down at some point and it's shit house, but it's just the way media works. And I told him, be prepared for that moment when people are going to try to take cheap shots out of you, pot shots, and people are going to try to bring you back down to size and don't fucking listen to him because you're an amazing player. who's going to do amazing things for this club and the league. You'll be one of the best players to ever play the game. And you get these people who want to make these little comments and things like that. Oh, he gets these easy touches and everything else. It's like, yeah, because if I were to mark the ball, you best fucking believe I'm going to give it to Nick Dacos because his ass can kick it five times better than I can. Probably more than that. Yeah, if he's And getting, he's going to be hitting hit ups that I wouldn't even dream about. If like, he's getting cheap touches, stop him. Yeah. Why don't you stop him? 100%. He's 19 years old. Can't be that good, right? When Anzac Day medals and everything else, dude's a freaking gun. But it's, I think the thing is, like, he does get those touches where he gets handball receives and he gets one twos and all that kind of stuff. And the reason is because he's a gun player who can hit kicks and give handballs and stuff like that that other players can't do. So play to your strengths, allow him to do that, and be able to, you know, move the ball forward where other players wouldn't be able to hit those kicks. And that's why he does that. And that's why we trust him to be able to get the, the, the ball 40 times a match. Because you know those 40 touches are going to be a lot better than if we try to go back, take our time, and try to do something else. It's like, give it to him. Let's move the ball forward quickly and try to get over the back. I remember Dane Swan. Now, I don't reference Dane Swan very often for, you know, <laughs> nuggets of wisdom. But mm. <laughs> but I remember at a press conference once, someone said, oh, you got this praise from someone in the media. How does that make you feel? And he said, well, if I don't listen to them when they're talking shit, why would I listen to them when they're giving me praise? Yep. And I always thought that's a good way to think about it. Mm. Just don't listen to them ever. Yeah. <laughs> but the no. line doesn't worry about the opinion of sheep. Ah, well, that's probably just a wise way of saying what a Dane Swan would say. But <laughs> there was a, a very wise man. We talk about Darcy Moore. Yes. The general, the captain. He probably saved you from about 
30 goals Mate, on the unreal. weekend. Dude unreal. was everywhere. Dude's like, I will play on six forwards. Yeah, <laughs> like, it was nuts. He's, he's doing a lot back there. A lot, a lot of people missing from defense at the moment, mm. but you only need one Darcy Moore. And it wasn't what he did on the field during the game. It was what he did on the field post-game yeah. with his uh, speech that he made when he uh, received the Anzac Day trophy. Yeah. Now, yeah, talk was, to us about this because everyone always seems dumbfounded that a footballer can, you know, <laughs> tie together a sentence, but he just, you know, oozes maturity yeah. and just leadership. He's um, he's a phenomenal person, like not just a footballer, but I think even more a person away from the field. And it's it's cool to see that shine whenever he has opportunities to speak up. And um, he spoke at the Nicky Wimar thing last week, spoke really well there. Um, obviously the Anzac you know, trophy presentation spoke really well there. And the fact that he, you know, you can go in there and just say, look, I don't want to, you know, talk too much or anything like that. You know, he goes in, he made sure that he hit every single part of being an Anzac, whether it be the families, whether it be the people who have been overseas, whether it be the veterans, he hit every single one. And it's a credit to him, man. Like it's not easy to go up there and have those speeches in front of a hundred thousand people. Like it's, it would be so nerve wracking. And then also the, the, you know, the energy of the game, then being exhausted and everything else on top of it. And just sit there, rock up, speak so well with such maturity in front of a crowd like that. Um, I'm just, I, I don't know, I don't know how to put it. It's a bit weird to say you're proud of a, a guy that you can <laughs> like good mates with, but like, so like, so freaking proud of him, what he does and the, the way he like handled himself and represents himself. He will be one of the most successful players not only on the field, but I think post career, whenever he finishes oh. up, that man, if he CEO. is not a CEO of a damn company, whenever he finishes up, I don't know who's going to be a better a better fit. I, look, I'm happy to put him CEO of the AFL right now because apparently they're <laughs> not going to decide. So happy to put his name up for that. But in all honesty, he's an amazing human. Um, cannot have more, you know, admiration for what he does. And it's just a credit to to his his family being brought up. He was school captain. He's worked really hard for these things, and he's um, he's one of those people that I don't think you'll find many that will ever have a bad word to say about him. And um, he's just going to lead this club into so much success. I'm I'm just so excited for it. One day you'll say some nice stuff about me like that, Mace. No. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon um, Collingwood's made some really good decisions of yeah. late, like getting in like fly to coach, getting Darcy on as. Uh, captain getting, you know, what would have to be the AFL's best American player of all time. Uh, Easily. <laughs> they're just doing all the right things at the moment. And I will say the second highest home and away game of all time. I want to say, yeah. Yeah, because I think Melbourne, uh, Collingwood again in 1958, number one, which I don't think will be obtained again because it was like 99,000 and with the way the MCG is all set up. But yeah, it was a great day, great win. Um, I think what is a good way to finish is an update on your injury because Oof. there was a few moments there where... <laughs> We needed the big fella back in there. We, just, <laughs> we were looking forward to Jamie Ellis, the tallest guy in the forward line. You're going, oh, jeez. <laughs> they were short. There was a lot of short blokes out there. Yeah, what are we are we all clear? Are you allowed um, to train? I've got some good news, yes. I did have the CT scan. Doc cleared me for being able to run. Not not contact yet, so can't play games yet. Just throw that out there, everyone. Calm down. Um, but I can train. So I've, I've been essentially a month of not being able to do any physical activity. So it's been very chilled. So I've lost a bit of conditioning. So these next two weeks or however long it's going to be, um, I'm going to get absolutely flogged. <laughs> like absolutely flogged by the team. Uh, sorry, by the, uh, by the high performance management manager and the conditioning coach but i'm excited man it's good to to feel like you can actually do your job again like it's weird to something have something stripped away from you that you essentially you're there for like your career is to work out and to be playing and to have it stripped away so quickly was um you know a bit of a, a slap in the face but it's so nice now i had my first run before um for the game and it was just the feeling of being able to get back to doing things like a normal athlete was awesome so We'll get another um, doctor's checkup before, uh, sorry, after the Adelaide game this week, and then that will kind of give me an idea of whether or not I can play. Uh, but yeah, it's it's good signs. It's good signs. We're heading in the right direction, which is good. So no more beers, pizza. You'll have to throw the vape away. You're like back into it. Uh, the Gatorade bottle. You got to put yeah, that the one. <laughs> Rossi had a good one on the weekend. Oh gosh, but hey, now to finish it off though, I don't know if you've seen it. A little bit of merch we got, Brayden. You forgot to mention it. You're staring right at it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a bit of Mason Cox Show merch out there. 
Now, it's a very limited edition, very, very limited, as in there's not many at all because we're in the very beginning stages of this. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in this, please hit us up because I want to I see if we can maybe sell some merch, get some people around this stuff, you know, get it out there. But it is going to be very limited, very limited. So you have to shoot us a DM if you're interested. That's some good quality. It's it is very nice and quality. tight around the pipes. I always oh, no. like that. Oh, no. And I don't <laughs> have big ones, ladies and gentlemen, so it'll fit anyone. Yeah, no, that's good because people have been hassling us in the DM. Mm. So if you want one, Jump in the DMs because uh, yeah. you might be a special, special person if you get to walk around the old Mason Cox show t-shirt. Yeah, that's I, it. I've, I've been eyeing off a few of those hats. Do I get any free stuff? Or? You do. You finally get free things sprayed in. This is what happens when you get into the media. Oh, well, we're in the big Freebies. time now. That's they're good. in the big time. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Absolute awesome episode. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Some absolute nuggets in there. Like we said at the beginning, though, if you haven't heard the Dustin Fletcher episode oh, that was it. before this, you have to listen to it. He tells a story oh. about uh, Alessio getting a spray from Kevin Sheedy, but there's a bit of a twist. There's a bit of a twist. There's a bit of a twist. He might not have played. That's <laughs> the twist. There's, and then he talks about some big parties in the offseason. Oh, some team trips of 150K. They were they raising were revenue just for offseason parties. Could it you imagine was, that now? Can you imagine that? You're, you're paying more. You're getting more of a kitty for that. People would actually be on a salary that's less than the kitty for the off-season trip. Out rattling the tins. Oh, Please give to Mason Cox so Mad good. Monday Fund. So good. There's absolute gems in there. So check it out wherever you get your podcast. It is the one before this show. We released it on the day before Anzac Day. Absolute gold that one is. So check it out. But that is it for the catch-up. The sports pod catch-up. Been a massive one. Uh, thank you to all the Anzacs out there for serving. Uh, thank you, everyone, that's made this week such a, uh, a memorable week and being able to to represent the Anzacs in such a special way. It's a, it's a credit to this country and what they do. And um, us on the show, we just want to say a massive thank you for doing what you do to give us the freedoms and rights to be able to do stupid shit like this. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Everyone, have an amazing weekend ahead, and we'll speak to you next week. Press up the pendles. Press up. <laughs> <laughs>